call the meeting to order at 6.05. Uh, first order of business would be to review and approve the minutes of the joint meeting for May 2nd, 2019. We'll call Frontier to order two at 6.05. Who would you like to call us for, Mr. Mr. Cantor, for the Union or Frontier? Because you're on both. Well, the first, the, the only one on the, on the floor sure. is the, is the okay. Phil, Phil, and Jeffrey Sack. This is for Union and voting members. All those in favor? We have a motion for Frontier for the minutes. Second. Everybody can vote except for Lynn. Lynn, you were absent at the time. <laughs> All in favor for Frontier? Baby boy, right? Baby boy. Yeah. Right? And, and I think we have enough new faces around the table that maybe we start here, we'll go around and introduce ourselves so that the new faces get to know some of the more veteran faces. Trevor McDaniel, Deerfield School Committee. Bob Decker, Frontier from Deerfield. Bill Cantor, Conway School Committee, and Frontier from Conway. Uh, Damian Fosno, Frontier Regional. Gary Mitchell, Student Committee. Ashley Leon, Frontier is Conway School Committee. Elaine Leone, Frontier. Elaine Campbell, uh, Conway Firm School. Katie Edwards from Waitley. Maureen Nichols, Waitley. Dave Sharp from Deerfield. Greg Gottschalk, Sunderland. Denise Storm, Conway. Lynn Roberts, Frontier. Lisa Shaw, Sunderland. Jessica Farley, Sunderland. Jessica Farley, Sunderland. Yeah, <laughs> 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 uh, Shelly Green, Director of Business Administration. <clears throat> Everybody knows your stairs. <laughs> Bob Halla from Waitley uh, Frontier and Whitley Elementary. Ken Cutterback from the Deerfield School. Judy. Judy. Judy Pierce, uh, Frontier. Oh, something like that. We, uh, we have public comment next on the agenda. Do we have any public comment? Present. Speak now or no. no unfinished business. We will move on to the MCAS presentation with Sarah and Kim. I think we all were handed a few color-coded sheets that we could follow along with. Another exciting year of MCAS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, transition. Remember when we do the joint meetings where Sarah and you came here, um, to kind of go run down of several things that we can do all together as one group. There's information that is pertains to each individual town. If you want to follow up at the next meeting regarding that, we can do that. But as a general overview of, the of information on each of these things, I think it was, it was nice just to have it kind of all in one, in one sitting and hear different people's ideas and such on those things. So, and then that's where I just want to kind of set the stage for you. So Dr. Mitchell. Yeah, I'm Sarah Mitchell, so I work uh, primarily at Frontier. However, um, Kim and I are across the entire district. Kim McCarthy uh, for the union, but Sarah and I work closely together. Our, our first on the show present yeah. presentation. Uh, so just to start out with, okay. 
Uh, a little bit of review for some of you who are new to MCAS, or at least as a school committee member, um, and then just a review for some that um, may have forgotten, because I know year to year I have to review a lot of information um, to make sure that we're up to speed on all the latest and greatest. So the old MCAS um, went out a few years ago in the elementary levels, grades three through eight, they've been phasing it in. Um, and this year was actually the first year that we are taking the next generation MCAS at the secondary level, grade 10, and so it will count for a graduation requirement. So one of the issues that they had with the old MCAS, and I've showed this slide before, is that they calibrated it in different years. And so therefore, if you had a student that was performing at about the same level, they could be anywhere from warning to needs improvement to proficient with the same score. And so it became problematic for families as they're getting these reports and trying to interpret them. And they were pretty meaningless. The reason why that happened is the tests were developed at a different times. So originally in 1993, they had three tests in Massachusetts, as those of us that were around in those days, it was grades four, eight, and 10. Then the federal government said, uh, we want you to test grades three through eight. So Massachusetts had to add tests in grades three, five, six, seven, or I guess it was tests in seven and eight, um, grade eight. And so it became very uneven in what was happening with uh, the overall assessment. So this time around, they developed a new assessment, and they were able to calibrate all those tests at the same time, and therefore, the tests are a little bit more meaningful as far as the scores that parents are getting. So you can have a student that's getting a 500 in fourth grade, and if the student performs about the same in fifth grade, they're going to calibrate it so the student gets about a 500 in fifth grade, and so on and so on. So a student who's getting a score in eighth grade I used to say to families, don't worry about it if your student had a warning or a needs improvement in eighth grade, because in 10th grade, their score is gonna shoot up. Now it's gonna be a little bit more predictable for students as they come through the system. One thing they did do this year, which was um, very interesting, <laughs> is they calibrated the 10th grade scores because they couldn't all of a sudden have all these students not meeting the standards and not graduating they calibrated it to the old MCAS. So we have students that are not meeting the expectations, which is in this red area here, but they are passing MCAS. So that's it, interesting. it's good news for our students, but very confusing when we were, when we were doing that. So there's four different categories, not meeting, uh, partially meeting expectations, meeting expectations, which means they're very on track for college and career readiness, and then exceeding expectations, just that next level up. Good, and you'll keep hit, hitting it for me. So we made this chart with um, our schools in comparison to the state, and we took an average from our schools to do this. Now we recognize that MCAS is just one score point, and we don't put all our eggs in that basket. But we do use it to inform our teaching instruction, we do use it for professional development, and we look at it through a lot of different lenses. But as you can see, uh, green is in a, a standard band that's um, at state level or slightly above and blue, blue is well enough above across our district. Now this new uh, next generation MCAS was really to bring the rigor up for the reading and writing piece and they thought that it aligned better with the college entrance and real world expectations. And they really only had that one year of data point 2018. So our scores that look like this this year may change next year based on what's happening in the bigger system and the statistical model that they use to align. So don't worry if you see fluctuations next year. We're at the beginning stages of this rollout, but this is kind of good news. And again, we use it just as one data point. And it was such a pleasure to sit on teams with principals and teachers because they look at it as this broad stroke, but then they also look at it in terms of standards and what are we teaching and what resources are we using. They look at it right down to the child level. Ah, oh, this worked, this strategy worked, this one didn't, maybe we can do this. And it's a very exciting to use this information to help steer where we go. But again, it's just one piece of information that we use. So um, in this is a relatively new accountability report. It came out in 2018 and it might look a little different when you look at it. That's what Sarah passed out. Um, to all of you, and you'll get a chance, Sarah will go over it a little bit more, but you've got your school's accountability report. These are the indicators that they really look at, 
And it's a little bit different between a non-high school, which would be our Union 38 schools. There are schools that have um, grades three through six in there. And what they do, it's a three to one ratio. They um, achievement is three to one student growth. And so they give another 10% for these other indicators. And obviously we don't have high school completion in our factors this way. And the high school is a little bit different. It's like a 50-50 achievement growth, student growth. A lot of emphasis, 10%, I think, is placed on high school completion and the rest of these are done in a 10%. So they're weighted differently at different scores, but they give us good information. And the whole idea behind this is the state and the fed federal government wants to help identify schools in need of resources. So they, um, I don't know if I can hit it too. Maybe. So, <laughs> but I want to go backwards. So they use this kind of thing where in the state of Massachusetts, there's 85% of the schools falling in this band and 15% of the schools that will need additional resources to support. And as you know, in your heart of hearts, we're in this band here and we have it historically. Right. So if we turn it back to the last slide and I'm thinking, nope, nope. oh, whoa. <laughs> I can't get it back. Okay. Um, so if you pick up, everyone has the accountability reports. This is all on the public uh, DESE website. Uh, the orange is the frontier. So if you look at overall progress towards improvement target, that's a percentage from one year to the next that compares oh, the God. school grouping that we're in with other schools like that. So as Kim mentioned, um, that non-high schools are any combinations of grades three through eight. High schools are grades nine through 12. And then they have this funny category that they call other, and that's for any school that has a combination of non-high school and high school. That's Frontier. It used to be a much smaller percentage that they were comparing us to across the state, which made these numbers fluctuate a lot more. And we found that there were a lot of um, charter schools and a lot of uh, those types of schools that were in that BN. Now it's a much larger population that we're being compared to because it's any school district that has a grade 10 and then any grade in the non-high school level. So it, it's a, I think it's a little bit of a better comparison, frankly. Um, and then if you look down below, you'll see all the categories that Kim was talking about before. And there are points assigned to each based on what the performance of that particular um, indicator was. So four means that you exceeded expectation or exceeded the target. Three meant you met the target. Two, there was no change. Um, oh, sorry. Two was you improved a little bit, but you did not meet the target. One was no change, and zero means you decline. And so you can kind of look at your individual school to see where it's all lining up on those particular indicators. <coughs> so as Kim mentioned, um, MCAS is not the only party in time, town. Um, and we use a lot of other data points when we're looking at individual students and we're looking at performance and curriculum and the growth of school. Um, there's obviously all of the teacher-generated assessments that we're using, but in addition to MCAS, we use a couple of other standardized measures. Um, one of them that we've been using for about 12 or 13 years now is NWA, or the MAP system. It gives us information about performance in ELA and MAP, and it gives us reports such as this. We can really drill down to an individual student's performance and these are the MCAS categories right there. Red would be the not met. Um, this orange band is um, you know, partially meeting. Yellow is actually partially meeting too, it's just on the higher end. Green is meeting and then the blue is exceeding. What you'll notice is this little dotted line here and that is, um, sorry, that is actually the national um, level of performance. Oops, sorry. Jump ahead all over the slide. <laughs> and so what you can see is nationally, the MCAS um, students on the national level would not be meeting, they'd only be partially meeting the standards of the expectations on the MCAS. And so that's kind of interesting. The MCAS, MCAS standard is pretty high. So we use these other measures to balance it. So now that you've already seen these slides, I can rush right through them. Um, at the high school level, we just started last year giving the PSAT to all, grade stu all students in grade nine and all students in grade 10. We have about three quarters of grade 11 students who are already taking it. 
We did that because we wanted another standardized score besides MCAS. We have a large percentage, about 80 or 85 percent of our students do go on to a secondary, um, either a two-year or four-year college. And we wanted to have students have as much experience with this assessment, the SAT, as they had with the MCAS assessment. Because they come up with these untimed tests and it doesn't necessarily prepare them for a test that times them. Um, so the, again, this is our second year. And our scores um, on the PSAT, I mean, if you look at these scores, uh, we're pretty high compared to the national average. Um, in the overall, our students, our school is 921. I gotta stop touching the screen. Um, <laughs> compared to the state, which is 836, and compared with the national level, which is 860. So we're quite a bit higher overall. But again, we're using this information to um, balance the MCAS and the NWA information. But they align nicely. Yeah, 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 it does align nicely. So that concludes our MCAS presentation piece. Questions? The other thing I want to point out is that if you haven't picked up on it, we did very well in MCAS this year. But we're just all, we're downplaying it because in the year we do well, we're, this is great. In the year we didn't do well, we're working on these are different sentiments. We're kind of showing that we always look at everything, but these are impressive scores across all five schools. So uh, just, I want to say that, if, in case you're not reading that into that, you didn't actually say that. I know you purposely didn't say that, but I want to say that. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Not because we come back next year. <laughs> it's tough. It is also difficult Take when you split. Yeah. Because they, they, they see where you are. And Terry, you can maybe put this in English. But they see where you are, and then they, that's your new bar you have to reach. And especially in some of those smaller schools where you can have a few kiddos different, and all of a sudden that bar isn't reached, and all of a sudden what happened this year. I mean, we're, you know, so that's why we're looking at state average and that kind of thing, not just overall um, bars we met there. So I just wanted to, make, sorry. Because there's a lot of hard work behind that, so I just wanted to make sure that teachers in the audience hear that. We, we like this. Any other questions? Questions or comments? Yeah, I think we're going to have to do this again. Yeah. Well, thank you, congratulations. You're here. Yeah. Hopefully in front of you, you all got a card. And um, what we did as an admin team is we took a poem and we wrote this and made these cards for every teacher, every IA, every kitchen worker, every bus driver, every crossing guard, every one of you, that we are in this together. It's all about connectivity. And through connectivity, we integrate our ideas, our hearts, our minds, our thoughts to lift everyone up around us. So it's our pleasure to give these to you tonight. And we really mean it, and the teachers really love this. We had a big kick kickoff for the PD. But how we did it last year is we surveyed the teacher to find topics. And two big topics emerged at the union level. They were academic rigor and student engagement and trauma-informed practices. And what the teachers are really hungry for is integrating this work not teaching in separate silos. I'm gonna teach about academic rigor and I'm gonna teach about social, emotional, and trauma and behavior over here, but they wanna blend it together so that they can be really agile in their instruction, in their classroom, to lift all the students in front of them. And to do this, we, brought, we tried to take the um, limitations of the professional development calendar because really at, at the union level, we have, what, about 21 hours, really, by the time you factor in parent-teacher conferences and if we're driving from, from one school to the next, maybe it's more like 24 hours. But you think about that. So we try to group things together. We don't want to go wide because we have a lot of stuff, but we want to go really deep with what we have to really develop those skills and that growth mindset to continue to meet diverse learners and diverse learning needs. And one of the big things that we did is start a district-wide PLC. It's actually a book club. And in it, we talked about trauma and children and trauma in your classroom and how that can be a challenge for anyone in the building and how we need to focus on that. These three books are on trauma, so, so union teachers got to pick one that fit their developmental level or their interest. But everyone also got a way to manage self-care. As a teacher, you're putting it out there on the field every day, right? And some days go smooth and some days don't. But the idea is that we are in this together. Connectivity, 
integration to lift everyone, and we have to take care of each other. So everyone got a copy of this. This is a book for trauma-sensitive school for the admin team, and then this is Marzano's new art and science of teaching. And, and teachers, when you go by on a PLC early release Friday, they are assigned to groups, they have reflection, they have next steps, they're reading, they're talking, you hear it at the copy machine in the hallway in the teacher's classroom, and it's a really exciting thing to be a part of. Um, there's so much going on with professional development. I'm not going to spoil it because we have some people that were doing it, but I'll kick it over to Sarah to talk a little bit about what's going on at the high school level. Um, so this is the first quarter of our years. We have a slightly different structure than at the elementary level. Um, advantages, we're all in one building and we're, design we're uh, separated by departments. So the green, we have a lot of color coding. We love, Kim and I both love color coding. So the green is kind of, we're all together as a school. These are things we're working on together. The yellow days are department days, and each department has a specific focus, and we're gonna highlight one of those focuses uh, this evening with some of our faculty. Um, and then any of the kind of light brown are outside uh, workshop professionals. Um, so we also, uh, about every other year, we've been doing book studies, and this year is our third year working with assessment. The first year we did an entire school-wide read of uh, Grading Smarter, Not Harder, and this year we had a selection of four books, um, all around assessment, all around grading, and so teachers came down, looked at the synopsis, and then over the summer they read one of these four books. Um, the idea was that the first couple of days that we got together, it's really a discussion about what the book was like. We did some gallery walking, some sharing of ideas, um, some free flow of conversation, with the goal being that each teacher would select something that they wanted to try this year. We'll come back together in March for our um, second part of the book discussion and talk about how it went. Was it successful? We'll do some sharing out as a faculty. And by doing this year after year, it's helping us evolve our thinking around assessment and good assessment because there's been a lot of change in assessment for those of you who are in education know the research is really just booming over the last four or five years and not just around the MCAS and the NWA and those kind of standardized assessment but all sorts of uh, different assessments. Um, so less talking and more showing. <laughs> So unless you don't have any questions, we'd like, it's, um... I'm gonna do just one last thing, which is you... Can I take you, this off here? Yes, yeah, you, you, uh, you get them going. And it's, it's we'll high school have, first. We're gonna have our science people come up. But we also gave you um, a two-sided sheet right here to have you um, have kind of an overview. For those of you who have been on the committee for long, we've been doing the PD Fridays for about five years now. And the first page with all the color on it is kind of historically what the big picture has looked like um, as far as PD. Now, you can look at our individual charts right there, and each year the charts have looked like that. So there's a lot of details and a lot of different things happening, but those are the general themes. On the back are all the outside consultants, pre presenters that we brought in over the past five years that have kind of helped us to evolve in our thinking about these different topics. We try to stay with the topic for at least two or three years. I think assessment for Frontier, we're gonna be at least one more year with that for four years. Um, and then at the end of each year or during each year, we're collecting feedback from faculty. Uh, the first few years we did a number of family surveys to see how the Fridays were working for them. And we're about to embark on another big examination of this particular model, this particular PD model in the early release Fridays and how that's going. Is it working? Is there a better model out there? Um, how would we make modifications with the model? So we're kind of at that point for a deep dive and examining that. All right, so with that, I'm gonna invite our science department up here to share with, uh, with all of you the real, the real, what's really happening around PD. These are the people with their feet on the ground and uh, this is a tremendous department. We're very, very happy with all of our faculty in the science department we're happy to highlight what they're doing. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hello, so I'm Dulcie and Amy Wells, Middle School Science. And Stacey Chapley, High School Science. And first, um, we just want to thank you for the time to have to work together and to support our professional development because having structures in, structures in place to do that 
help our growth. Um, you know, we would seek it out regardless, but having that support built in is, is helps it be really successful. And so, and it says a lot to us, so we really appreciate that. So, um, so Science Fridays, I'm gonna stand up in a second. <laughs> um, <laughs> so on Science Fridays, we've been um, using our professional development days to uh, support our relationship with an organization called Access. Um, and that's made up of two organizations called Mass Bio, um, BioEd and Science from Scientists. And these are two organizations that focus on one on high school and one on, on middle school. And Access brings them together so that we can work, bring both of those together. So Frontier is one of only four schools that has been awarded a, uh, awarded a grant from Access. Um, so our grant was uh, $5,000 towards equipment, which included pretty amazing technology, which uh, Stacy has some examples of once we're done. And we also, it also, yeah. I'd just like to pause for a moment and tell you that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Um, it also enabled us to get uh, free presenters, so we have um, professionals who are coming and meeting with us and giving us uh, professional development, and it's free. And they also give us their curriculum that they've developed for free. Um, so that's really wonderful. And again, Amy and Stacy both wrote, wrote that grant, which was really wonderful. So. Okay, so um, what is Access? Access is a program that brings um, teachers administrators and scientists <laughs> together. <laughs> I teach middle school, just, just saying. <laughs> um, and what they do is they provide teachers with vertically, vertical alignment, hands-on life science labs, as well as career experiences for students. So what does this actually look like? So um, if we talk about an example such as genetics, if we looked at a lesson, they came in uh, and taught us about, so they gave us the curriculum, uh, a, a lesson uh, called Phenotypes and Genotypes that was gonna be, that's gonna be used in seventh grade. And then they um, taught us a lesson and we got to do, do it hands-on uh, that was called Science Behind DNA Fingerprinting. And so these are directly in line with each other and we're all experiencing it. So you know, when I'm teaching eighth grade, I know what they've learned in seventh grade and I know where they're going in eighth grade and so I can support that as well. Um, it means that we have common technology uh, and equipment. Um, so, for example, micro pipettes that I use in seventh grade, and then even in eighth grade, um, we use it when we're doing it around volume, and then they use it again when they get to high school, which is really wonderful. It also helps us really build intentionally our vocabulary. So, for example, in the seventh grade, they learn to use the word control, and then in high school, they're going to deepen that and and learn to use the uh, vocabulary like positive controls and negative controls. And so here's some comments from the teachers. Um, so it enables them to practice lessons that uh, are lessons that made abstract concepts real. Um, our teachers said, you know, these were some of the most hands-on, fast-paced teacher trainings, and they can't wait for them to come back. Uh, it's a mutualistic par partnership that is the collaboration of great minds. And this is our favorite, of course. <laughs> um, and this is a comment from a seventh grader who said, I want to be a scientist because of this lab. I can't wait to, to do more of it in the future. So, that's it. Yeah. So, any questions? All right. Do you see this expanding? Would you be working with other other companies or other groups, would they be offering another program in the future? So it's going to be a three-year program, actually. And so right. the first year they do, uh, we're doing two labs, and then the next year they'll do a reinforcement of the two, and we get two new ones. And then the the third year, um, is it another? I can't remember exactly, but it keeps building on itself. It, it, yeah. And um, we we get to have also like other schools come like even our last Friday when we had some teachers come from other schools as well which was really nice because we get to also meet others. But. Um, one of the cool things is we've um, we received the grant just over a year ago to buy our own equipment 
Um, and now that the kids have come up through seventh and eighth grade and I have them as ninth graders, uh, we were test driving one of the new labs that will be part of Access. We were the, my intro to biology class was the first time it's been rolled out and actually done with a class. And the coolest thing was is the kids had already handled micro pipettes. So in being able to just do a quick refresher on how to use, how to do good uh, micro pipetting is huge. And, and with these organizations is getting kids excited and into um, the STEM fields. Um, Mass BioTeach is supported by um, all the, the, a lot of the biotechnology companies where the epicenter is right in Cambridge and they just opened up a new office um, right here at the UMass Amherst campus. And so as the, the one student you had that says, I'm excited, I wanna do more of this. And so as we're bringing them up through the high school, um, they, they are using the equipment and learning about the equipment in, right from as a freshman in biology, um, in elective classes such as forensic science, um, AP Bio does it throughout the whole year. Um, we're able to um, do citizen science and do studies. Um, and so this is, the kids get excited and, and that's what we want to see is to take them to that next level. And the professional Friday is like having that time, even without, you know, mass bio ed. Like we we we've, we've done times where we're, especially like in the middle school, it's really wonderful. Like there's equipment up at the high school that we get lessons on, so that we get to use them. And it's really wonderful too because safety is really important. And having a chemist, you know, to talk to and discuss about how do we keep this really safe, what equipment do we use, is really awesome. So. We want to give a huge thank you too to everyone who voted for us to have those PD Fridays and have like our full <laughs> days because those are so incredibly helpful and it's like we couldn't have done all of this stuff if we didn't have that time to do it. Yeah. So that's been so helpful and it's great for our kids too. So thank you. Yeah. And and you know one of the the equipment they're using was just being invented when a lot of us were in high school. Um, so the the technology the the uh, PCR machine the polymerase chain reaction you know that's that was co coming into fruition back in the mid 80s, the electrophoresis chamber, the DNA fingerprinting, all of that. Um, so as an older person <laughs> going, whoa, we've come so far and to be able to bring this high tech, um, but also bringing it down so the kids are understanding it and, and things that they, they may not be able to grasp um, in a large scale, they can they can they can see that that molecular level, and be able to play with it. So um, it's always a learning opportunity for for the for, for us as as uh, professionals to be able to bring um, all that new fun stuff to the kids and get them excited. And as I said, then it transports in further down the line. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. So here is Terry Anderson oh. and Paula King. They're going to just talk about a PD initiative at the elementary level. Yes. And I can hit it. You don't have to hit it. Yeah, until you get the right house. Yeah. They're going to tell you how. Oh, that's yeah. yeah. Not yet. <laughs> you can get more. Not yet. <laughs> okay, so nice to be here with all of you, and we're really excited to talk to you about Empatico which is something that we're doing at Waitley Elementary School. Uh, we've been lucky because we've been making global connections at Waitley Elementary School for about eight years, um, particularly with schools in Tanzania. Uh, but last year, a new thing came out called Empatico, and it's just streamlined everything for us. And it's so exciting. It's an online free platform for teachers to connect classes, internationally or domestically. And so we were doing it all last year, and um, with a lot of administrative support, um, we got to the uh, position where we wanted to do it in the other schools as well. And so now we have um, a district-wide fellowship for Empatico teachers. And there are over 20 people that are doing that from all four elementary schools. 
And so we're really excited and we want to thank all of our very supportive administrators for um, always uh, having our backs so that we can do really cool things with the kids. So this was not made by anyone with really great tech skills, but I think it's <laughs> going to give you an idea of what our kids, this is all at Waitley, but now it's happening in the other schools as well. And I think you'll get a really good idea about what we're doing. And Paul is going to tell you a little more about the fellowship. So with the fellowship, we have 20 teachers who committed at the end of the school year to meet as a group for a day and learn about impact to go and how to get their class up and running and connecting to another class, as Terry said, around the world or in the U.S. And so these teachers have learned a little bit about the platform, which we said is free. And what, what's great about it, in my opinion, is that you've got teachers who are connecting, say, from Waitley to, um, I have a connection in Ghana, I also have a connection of, with someone in South Carolina. And so those teachers actually connect on kind of like a, a texting, a messaging thread that's all very private and is not getting teachers or kids names out there, so they're, we're really, concerned and um, cautious about a digital footprint of what's going on with our kids. So these connections are happening and it's not like on the world wide web that anyone can get to. So the teachers connect with one another, they plan what lesson they're going to do, and uh, then those classes then get to meet at some point. And so that meeting time is through Empatico, kind of like a Skyping session. and. Um, it's been fabulous. Like last year we had everyone from sixth grade to first grade who, con who connected and it's amazing what they can do. And I th I'm the library media specialist at Whaley and kids would come in and they'd have their questions about, do you have backpacks in Nigeria or whatever it was the question and I'd, I'd take a little picture of them with an iPad and then we'd upload that to their site. So there's a way to upload pictures and communicate even just before you even connect as um, a group class to class. So. I think you're gonna recognize one of the stars. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. if you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer them.
dirt bike, which is like a motorcycle, reading, watch movies, and sports. Um, some of them. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks for supporting the kids and the teachers. If anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. So are all the schools doing it now? The four elementary schools. Yeah. We're just getting it off the ground now. Yeah, it's very exciting. It's really a fabulous program, so thank you for all you guys are doing. I'm glad it's going to the other schools. Yeah. Good. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say that over the years we've worked hard to support professional development. The uh, Friday program is, uh, I think, is being used effectively. Personally, think it's being used effectively, and um, certainly the grants that are found and add to what the schools are able to offer is an indication that the teachers are, are certainly committed to it. Taking advantage of it, so uh, I know it's a it's it's always a conversation that's had in our school community meetings in, in the spring uh, when we're talking about calendar and uh, dealing with feedback on the professional development, maybe from the general public. But uh, it's important, especially in this day and age. We're talking about things that were happening when people were in high school or when I was in high school. None of us would even imagine. So uh, I certainly appreciate the efforts that Kim and Sarah Lee for the district and, and Darius and the, and the rest of the administration. So, thank you. Just, just to follow up on that. So the game plan is, as you know, the uh, request was that the administration look at the professional development. So today was really about kind of showing where we're at, snapshot in time, showing what's going on this year. Um, and it is the charge, I charge out to my administrative team, that we're looking at how we're delivering it and to come back for the joint meeting in April to discuss where we're at, propose. Um, and I'll get, I'll get, it won't just be a surprise for the meeting, I'll let committees know prior to that meeting what's going on, um, but what we want to do moving on to next year. I don't know what that is yet because we're still in the process of kind of looking at how we do it, how far do we veer from what we have now, um, and the importance of it. So that's kind of the, so today was, today was really about just kind of giving a snapshot of how, how, where we've been, what we're doing, kind of what it looks like, uh, the importance of it, because we're you know, definitely going to fight to not go back to the old model was, which was no movement. Um, we have a significant advantage of two compared to other districts. I mean, with other superintendents, when I talk about our professional development model, everybody's envious of us. Uh, I, I'm trying to find someone who's got a better system than we do, because we're able to look at programs, get time, get those programs in the classroom. Without this time, you're basically, uh, you're going on your, your top teachers who are going to find that time outside of the work day, um, not moving the whole school together at once. So uh, anyway, so I don't need to go into a speech about it, but the game plan is to uh, come back in the spring with a, with a plan of how we want to approach it and then try to get your buy-in at that point. Yes? Just thinking about the other uh, constituents that are affected by early release, the parents and the families and the students, is there going to be consideration about that side of the program? Because clearly this side is working very well. But I just want to reiterate that it's not right. necessarily it's, ideal for the students. We, without, you know, the, without going down the rabbit hole of the different problems that are, are I mean, there are, there, there, the, the different issues are, one, I think that the professional development has changed through the years. Um, and I think it's improving. And I think we've, we've gotten uh, uh, buy-in to the model from all from all groups. Um, the major one of the major issues is that gap care um, and what to do with that and the cost of that. We have not only the professional development of bringing in speakers, but you have the cost of uh, right now we provide free gap care um, and what that what that means. And so 
and the burden it puts on families who depend on school as um, child care. So and it's balancing those two things out. Of the Right, I know. And I, and I know that and I know when the original program was rolled out, it was going to be, right, there was going to be uh, um, a lot of extension stuff that was going to happen and those kind of things, but it, it has to do with uh, the amount of resources that it takes to do that. So we're going we're gonna to jump over the uh, superintendent's evaluation and we're going to do the strategic plan next. Right. So I sent out um, a electronic version, um, but some people like electronic, people, some people don't. We do have to figure out as a committee where we're going electronic and where we're going with paper and that kind of thing. So I'll try to, between now and the next meeting with everybody, I got, I don't know how many copies to make at every meeting. Thank you. And some stuff people want to kind of flip through and stuff people, some people want to just have a digital form. So, so I did kill a trick. Um, so I will pass these, uh, the strategic plan moving, so this was created by, you know what I gave to the three of these guys, right? Um, this strategic plan was created building off of what we have been doing, because I didn't want to leave, start anew without looking at what was created um, years prior to my arrival. Uh, the administrative team, which I think we should, I should have you all introduce yourselves in case we need to learn start. Hi, this is Mr. Morgan. Ben Barshevsky, Principal of Sunderland. Lucy Clark, Principal of Waveney. Tina Jeff, Principal of Deerfield. George Lanetis, Principal of Frontier. And of course, Kim and Sarah also as part of that group. And um, actually, I have the whole administrative team at, at this site. Uh, yeah. At these meetings, where we kind of went through and looked at a lot of different data um, from the surveys that went out to um, the we're working on professional development areas of concerns with teachers, just general um, information that we picked up through the years and kind of kind of created the areas we wanted to go. So this is kind of spells out um, kind of the roadmap of where we're going. Uh, there is a, it says public version, there's actually a, I want to call it a private version, but there's a working version that has a lot more information in it that talks about how we're going in each spot, but we kind of broke it down to make it basic to go through. Um, so I don't know how we want to do this in the sense of... You got a vote on it. Well, yeah, it, I would like approval from the school committee that you like the direction we're going. I'm, I'm not sure, uh, unlike school improvement plans that have to be approved by the school committee, I'm sure officially this strategic plan has to be approved. The last strategic plan was approved. That's how it was going on. So I don't know if the legality is it, but, um, I guess this is kind of the roadmap of where we're going. This is the nuts and bolts of um, the professional development model, which is kind of the, uh, is the delivery for a lot of this. Um, you know, but it is, is, is the, you know, the minute team's roadmap, so. Uh, Can you provide it an executive overview? Sure. Very um, semi-quickly. Sure. <laughs> And you know what I'm gonna ask Sarah and Louise, uh, Sarah and Louise, sorry, Kim. <laughs> Sarah and Kim to kind of come up and jump up as well. You guys can um, just help me walk through it. Um, so the first thing is that we are, um, we don't have in place, so help me jump in if I missed that, right? We don't have in place a, a strong curriculum management plan, uh, which we need to develop to over, oversee the curriculum in the district. When does it have to be updated? What areas are, are strong which areas are weak and so we need to create a plan in that area. Um, within those areas we also need to look at um, identify priority areas for students across all subjects. That's looking at data as well um, from standardized testing to uh, course uh, course feedback from teachers and that kind of thing. Uh, and you can see from there creating corrective skills for each of those grades. Um, so that are making sure our courses are feeding into one another, that one's building on the other. Um, those, that, it's not that those things aren't in existence, but those are areas that can improve. We improve that and improve the construction process. 
So as we saw earlier, we are an above average district, but in order to stay above average, you have to keep that, that, that uh, the focus moving forward. Um, looking at equity, um, while there's not a lot of diversity um, in our district, there is diversity. Um, and we need to make sure that we're reaching all, uh, all learners um, in looking at, in, in looking at, uh, at the data there. Um, and again, equitable access of all learners to the curriculum, not just making sure, um, not just looking at the, uh, the data, but going diving deeper. Um, the next one is, um, Establish a delivery model. Sarah, if you jump in on that one, that was for who we deleted the other part of that. Yeah, so we just want to make sure that we're communicating what we have as expectations in the classroom. Do we expect students to be arranged in small groups? Do we expect students to be engaged in collaboration and communication? So we need to have that clearly defined so that um, the whole district is on the same page. Um, continuing down MTSS, that's the, uh, those are intervention. It's a new new, pro, uh, new thing that's being put out by the state. A few administrators and myself went to a training a few weeks ago. I felt we were ahead of the training that the state was putting out, but we're gonna take the, the positive things from that um, training and move it forward uh, to the classroom. Um, then we go a lot into the professional development plan onboarding program for new teachers. We're getting a lot of turnover, not teachers leaving, but people retiring. And we've got a lot of new faces over the last five years and making sure that we have a proper onboarding program. Um, the trauma-informed care you heard about earlier, we are seeing more and more students coming to us with more and more uh, things going on in their lives. In that term. Um, and we need to make sure that the teachers have the skills and that the schools are set up um, to work with those students. The uh, TPD, we talked about that regarding engagement and rigor. Um, we need to continue to work with administrators to how we're, we have new administrators as well, how we are uh, observing teachers and how we're looking at the same thing moving forward. If we have many, multiple different buildings, people are seeing different things, and that's part of what we do uh, monthly. We move our meetings to each building, we get these classrooms together, we calibrate together what we're seeing and communicating that. Uh, the MTSS training I talked about earlier, but it falls again in this area. Um, uh, more PD uh, involvement there with the uh, content specific. And then um, looking at student assessment, we talked about that again in, with the uh, professional development earlier. Looking at um, common assessments, homework, um, why we assess, what's going on in the classroom. Um, see that cross all through those different assessment areas there. Objective forward governance control. Um, a lot of our job descriptions are out of date. When we start talking about what's the role of teachers and how does that tie into different curriculum and those kind of things, so we need to update those. Um, we need to work on public communication of what our curriculum and what's going on in the classroom, um, including the management plan, assessment plan, on a side note, we're also looking at, um, we just talked about this at the chair's meeting last month, or this month, um, regarding, we have to look at our regional agreements, and skills are out of date as well. So I kind of, that's kind of a tack on the end, most of the other steps are very quick construction. And then uh, creating a strategic capital plan, we've been talking about that for the last year, for the next three to five years, and have that transparent, so that we're working with our towns, we know what our needs are for the aspirate. I know it was a really fast overview. Um, I really appreciate it. Any questions or thoughts? Bob? Uh, the school Improvement Council. So this is not the school improvement plan. So the school improvement plan still have to come from each elementary school. Um, the agency, it's very easy for them to tie much of their plan through the strategic plan. It is very, very wide. Uh, breadth of what it covers. So the idea is that you create a strategic plan, then you have school improvement plans underneath it that trickle kind of that work together. It really should not be if one's very different than the other, then one's missing it. But schools still can come up with some of their own um, areas they want to work on. If it doesn't fit, then we can modify 
the strategic plan staff. We are small enough and nimble enough where we can modify. This is an overview that's supposed to take in off of five entities, and each one of them can have their own separate uh, plan. That yes. Could exceed in some cases. Right. Absolutely, and, certain, and there are, in some cases, some buildings have to work on some things more than others, and, there's, and so, but we're working on it together because to do this in isolation is not oh, I, I agree with you, but what I'm saying is that some schools are going to have their own area of concentration where they want to pick up on something that they think that is neglected. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing is, I think there should be more emphasis on uh, getting us out of the stone age and to a one regional agreement as a well, long-term goal. Right. And I know it, it's, it's been up, it's been down uh, in the last 40 years, seven or eight times it's been talked about, okay. but we are missing the boat on, on uh, school bus A in the uh, elementary schools. And there is a little bit more cost because of the insurance and uh, we probably end up having to end up with parity for the teachers, but maybe not between the elementary and the high school. And I'm not an expert at it, but what I'm saying is we should not just fluff it by and we need to. So the, the groundwork I have set for that is that um, I met with the chairs, um, as you guys all know, I talked about that in the spring. And we were talking about creating a subcommittee, two subcommittees, one would look at the Frontier Regional Agreement and one would look at the Union Agreement, which we do not have in paper. Um, in front of us. So, and I really, in, when I look at the stepping stones, I'm not talking about regionalization. I'm talking about giving us some structure. So when we talk about what is the, what is the required way to vote for the hiring of the superintendent, we don't know. So, I mean, those are some things that we, there's just some basic, I want to get some of the basic steps before we go into the politically fiery areas of do we regionalize, do we do those kind of things. So it's kind of a two-step process. I want to get a document in place and then we can amend the document. But it is also your purview. And that's kind of the, the course of point in the boat. And then you can ask for, we're going to create committees to decide how exactly to get there. But that's, I'll be going to each elementary committee to look for volunteers to go on to that subcommittee uh, to work with the union, uh, union uh, 30 there. And then Frontiers will do the same thing by looking at where do we need to type like that. So does it eventually get there? Maybe, but I want to be one step at a time and get us to have a functional. It might not happen. Well, Bob, it hasn't yeah, worked in 40 well. years since you've been so, around so long. So, and there are parts that does work. You know what I mean? I'm trying to like, create more headaches, but there are kinds I have to call the attorney, like, I don't know, what's, what's the, ready for the example? I'll give you the truth example thing. Are we supposed to vote a new chair to the committee tonight? Is it a one-year term? Is it a three-year term for the, for the union? Well, other districts do multiple-year terms. You know, um, some districts do one-year terms. It was a light agenda, I didn't put it on in time, so just carrying through so we can add that to the next one but we don't have any bylaws that says how long does one do those kind of things so I keep, I keep stumbling over those things and I keep writing it down but that's not the best way to run them. all right sorry I got sidetracked there. Bill? so just because because Bob brought this up I brought this up I think sort of compelled to say that the, the issue of regionalization for K to 12 has been looked at repeatedly and exhaustively I think I was part of the committee that Marty formed I don't forget how many years ago um, and, and the, the amount that we would save in transportation reimbursements, we would, we would more than lose that amount in the equalizing of the co-pays and deductibles from town to town to town. And so the, the, right now, as it exists, unless there is a specific item of state aid, a specific act of the legislature that would enable us to start a K-12 district at zero, um, which which they used to do. Um, it's it, we can, we cannot if, for us right now just to say okay we're going to do K through 12 would result in a huge financial hit for um, pretty much everybody. So like it's stop bringing that up. Bob. Well, I well, well I agree with that. I'm with it. So you can talk about it all you want. All right. Like, well, while I agree with that, Phil, um, in the long term, if you look out and years towns very hard to afford you know educating a very small amount of it kids yes. in one school you know, so I think we still need to keep hitting it but um, it's, it's difficult you're right it would equalize 
that you could always well, answer an act of unless the the, unless the state's going to give us the money the first year to change and the biggest the biggest change correct me if i'm wrong is one teacher contract from another teacher contract yeah. Let's <laughs> not go down the rabbit hole. I'm not talking again. I'm not proposing for a I'm proposing just to have basic governance on paper before we move to any type of regionalization discussion. I agree. Second half. All right. <laughs> so we, All right. We, have a we have a draft strategic plan that we're not going to alter that we uh, include regionalization <laughs> studies. We'll be um, accept. That's okay. We can move to accept for Frontier. Yeah. We have a second for Frontier? Second. Could I get a motion to accept from the union? So moved. Second. For Frontier, all in favor? Are you voting on this? Against? Any opposition? None. Any abstentions? None. So it's 11 to 0. Thank you. Next is, next is uh, another paper. Another tree. Yeah. Uh, uh, in this tree, I apologize for Don, I meant to do it back to back. Um, my evaluation, so again, the idea on this was we were trying to create an evaluation, um, use the word model, that we can use moving forward, that um, it's easy to use, that um, it was easier, it's easier to do in someone's first year when things were going okay, and, and uh, that kind of thing. I'm just being bluntly honest on that. But, so this is the summary results of all that, of all those who participated in the, uh, in the evaluation. And basically you have to vote to approve the summary so that it can be submitted to the state. I, I just want to say that, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's uh, probably the most people who have filled out the evaluation we got like 20, 25 members, 17 members filled it out online. It made it easy for us to do it online. I did it twice, it didn't count twice, but I didn't think the first one was through. So, so but if, 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 the, if somebody says, I didn't get it online, that means something happened with the your email, but everybody got it online, it was easy to fill out. Um, there were some people that, wrote some comments with it, but overall we had a proficient, proficient valuation of uh, Darius. Um, Mr. Bob? Uh, for front the acceptance of the evaluation. Does anybody? Then I want to say something. Oh, why don't you say something first? Yes, I think that there are some people that uh, found certain things to be quite proficient or exemplary and I would hope that they would discuss their individual issues with Darius. Can you speak up please so everybody can hear you about I would hope that they would discuss the, their issues uh, with Darius so that he can uh, explain his position and try to uh, mitigate whatever the deficiency is in somebody's opinion because that's the only way you really learn. Sorry. The only thing I'll echo on that is you're on my bosses, but you don't have to wait to an evaluation to give me feedback on something you want to change. If well, you're, waiting, you're some... waiting to give me feedback, then I can't. Evidently, somebody can't. did. Right, that's, that's <clears throat> Does anybody else have any questions from Frontier? All, all in favor from Frontier for an evaluation? Raise your hand. Um, but I just just uh, say in public how, how proud I am of the company. 
work that uh, our superintendent is doing. Um, I've worked with him on several issues, uh, several things that we've worked on together through throughout this past uh, short year, I guess. But um, it's just been wonderful to work with. It feels great consensus and um, really brings everybody together as a team to get things done. Um, the school and the staff and the students. So, um, next time I'll, I'll write that down for you. But thank you. So I really appreciate it. So thank you. So I'll move my move. Second. Second. Oh, I'm not really going to have a question. No, that's fine. Okay. Yes, go ahead. I used to follow up with what Bob said um, with some of the uh, uh, unsatisfactory or, or how we, I was looking through these. And the only thing I see is no rating. Is no rating just meaning that they didn't vote, but there actually is there was some unsatisfactory. Yeah, there was. I mean, go ahead. So when I constructed it, I put in the ability to say no rating, meaning before members, I got the feedback that members in the past were forced to give a rating even if they had no knowledge on the subject. And so therefore they felt like I have to get proficient because if I don't get proficient, I have to give a, give a reason why, but I have no idea if I need right. good instruction. I mean, some of, the, some of those areas are very difficult. We talked about how the evaluation is difficult because it comes from the state. There's some things that you may not know the answer to. So I created an extra column that's actually not in the state thing, but, but it says I have no information on this and I can't read this area. So really there's no negative feedback there. Then what Bob was just oh, was, oh, there's one, there's one area in communication where there were some um, needs improvement ratings that were okay. submitted. But by and large, it was 60 to 70 percent of the respondents were rated at proficient. Somewhere between 15 and 25 percent said uh, exemplary, and then the, the no rating was the, the other category. So this overall, I believe the cumulative rating is um, about 68 percent proficient, 18.8 percent. Oh, that's just the standard, the first standard, but it's somewhere around 20% mm -hmm. um, exemplary, and the rest would be no ratings. And, and the part of the problem is that when we go to an assessment, or this assessment, we distributed it at a time when we had several new members that really had no experience, and on top of not understanding the state's uh, categories. Um, so it's really I, I think it's a it is the strongest I mean it's the most participation that I've had a chance to see an evaluation done and having it online was that helpful for people yes, um, yes. certainly I know it certainly made it easier for me because I didn't have to do the tabulation at the end of it but uh, <laughs> I, agree. Um, I think it it takes some thought to work your way through the standards that are essentially established by the state. It's a, it's a really tough, I mean, when it first came out, we had a special training of almost an hour and a half on, on the new evaluation system for superintendents. And it's like, how are we ever gonna get through this? Um, and, and this really, to me, simplified things for, for everybody. And I'm glad to hear that people found it helpful here. Um, I'd like to say two things. First of all, I used the no rating in several occasions, probably more than anyone else, because absolutely there were some issues that were raised there that I had not a clue as to whether uh, he had done well or badly or a lot or a little. It just And so it was really useful to be able to say no rating and to focus my ratings on issues that I had seen him in action on. And so I thought that was great and I hope that's able to be kept. The other thing was, am I missing something? But I see a summary for his uh, rating in each of uh, four standards, but I don't see an overall summary. Is that on purpose? I, I don't think, I, I don't know the software that was used, and I didn't get the chance to ask if we could get an overall summary. Um, I'd have to go through and do that, because there was not a total score of each right. one as it was created. I'd probably create that in the future and such. You know, yeah. uh, well, that's it. Cool. This, cool. the, this was the first, first right. attempt at it, yeah. so we can, we can certainly find out if we can get the overall summary. But I think you'd find that it roughly is in line because the percentages are pretty close in each category. Right. As I look through it. 
I mean, I think it's a, you know, you don't want to write too much into one overall number. On the other hand, in communications with the town side in, in my town, you know, I try to keep them informed on things, and, and one thing would be, well, how's this new superintendent doing? And here, well, this is how we rated them. And, you know, sometimes being simple is oversimplifying, but it also makes it understandable. And in this case, we've got what I consider to be a superintendent doing a great job, uh, my, my no ratings notwithstanding, and, um, you know, I like to let people know. Great. I, I can create a summary sheet soon enough. Thank you. So, any other questions or comments? I, I will echo what Peter just said. I think Darius has had a strong first year, and uh, I was pleased to see that other committee members felt the same way. So, so that's it. Did we get a second on that? We did. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, exactly. We had a second. So, with that being said, for the union, all voting members, all those in favor. Thank you. And thank you, Darius. Congratulations. Thank you. Jump from that straight to So I put the policies on it. It's a lot easier than breaking it up and doing the policy votes five separate times. We do them all at once. They don't seem to be very controversial in nature. So on the, on, the, on the first one, the KHC, um, we need a, a motion so moved. for Frontier and second. Bill? Sure. All in favor from Frontier? So moved. And I would entertain a motion for, take a motion for the union for KHC policy. Second. Discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Thank you. Policy and IMGA. So moved. Second. Bill Second. Sure. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. And for the union, do I have a motion? Jessica, who attended, you attended, I don't want to speak for you, but you attended, notice that we are among the very The MTA, I'm an MTA member, they're asking um, their members to come to the school, school committee and try to go around to the last remaining school committees to finally pass resolutions in favor of the Promise Act. This is a little complicated tonight because when it passed the Senate last week, it was renamed the Student Opportunity Act, so we wouldn't be using the original wording to pass it. And so, and I also said, just that we, it's, it's come up, it's come a long way from the beginning, meaning that you know, for those of you, I'll give a quick, and that's already been turning into a long night, but just kind of give a quick overview. Within the Student Opportunity Act, um, the good news is they're looking to put a lot of more money into public education. That's the overall, that's the good news. And they're also looking at the different, they're trying to create subcommittees to look at the different funding models and that kind of thing, and where that goes, we'll see. The bad news is that we fall in an area where we're not going to see much of this money. And there may be a few thousand here or there, um, but it's a much longer explanation that I probably should give in, in, in smaller groups of people can ask questions, if they're comfortable asking questions at the member meeting. But how we are funded and how Chapter 70 funds are used to make up the difference from the foundation, we fall in this. I started going down that road. I won't go down that road. We fall in an area where we won't see much of this money because we overfund our schools. Yeah, okay. Still in comparison to what the state's saying. And we still don't know how much uh, town 
towns will be expected to pay. So we, we have some numbers on kind of what we'll get, which is very minimal over over those seven years. Um, at the end of 2027, it's, it's very little amount of increase from where we are today. But and, we still don't know. And right now, the numbers are all over the place. There's a lot of different revisions going through. So there's a lot of the excitement is correct that there's a lot of good changes because things are being addressed that have not been addressed. But there's still a lot further they need to go in order to look at school systems like ours, small towns with declining enrollment, where the local um, taxpayer is picking up the majority of the bill, or it seems to be picking up more and more of the bill. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, we can kind of get into the, the weeds of it. But there, it, And then on top of all that, it has to be if you appropriate it at the way each step each year moving forward as well. So it's, it, some of it, it sounds good, but they also there are areas I've seen through the years where they cut from these different areas. So we'll see how it we'll see how it plays out. But it is exciting they're they're, they're, they're moving forward. With it, so are there any uh, clauses in it that we might live to regret where they didn't tell us what to do? It's about merging schools or et cetera. Are we gonna lose control? Are you talking about the, are you talking about the resolution this yeah. evening? No, no, I'm or talking the, about the uh, act. Right? What's in it? I, I hate to vote for something where I don't know what the detail. Is. That's the difficulty of where we're at now because nobody knows yet. So well, it was also this was most schools voted this before the act the bill was actually put forward. This is a, this this resolution is supporting something that's not really on the floor. I mean, a lot of the parts are in here. But I'd rather see a, a, I'd rather see a complete scope on, on what's involved. Yeah. Before I go, go to endorse something that could take, turn around and take away an awful lot of our prerogatives. We don't have any prerogatives <laughs> left. I'd read it. It doesn't take away any of your prerogatives. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. It doesn't for local control. It's long. It's complex. But it talks about just giving schools more money. And, it's um, and it has its own. No, we're not going to get to. No, but, but some people will, so it's a good thing. They will be fully funding the reimbursement for charter schools over the next four years. Um, and some, some transportation, but not regional transportation. Transportation for special education, maybe, but not. Uh, some circuit breaker stuff, but. Um, I know. Yeah, we're yeah, going into the weeds. So the way, don't go in the weeds, because I was at a meeting today that they're going to not actually, they're not going to fund the transportation equally with the rest of everything. They're going to fund it second. So, so, so it's, it's again, they're playing with the numbers already where it's not going to have an immediate effect on some of our schools. So, um, I like the idea about but we can discuss that. On charters. So, but, so, but let me just kind of go through what, what we're trying to say here. It's basically, we're, we're, we're saying that we support that we want free public schools available to all students without exception, and that our foundations are our democracy. That um, no matter where they live, they deserve high quality public schools to teach provide them with well-rounded school experience and address their academic, social, emotional needs. And the state funding uh, budget for the term state each to each district has been woefully out of date for years. So this is what we're asking them to look at. Therefore, underfunding our districts by more than a billion a year for essential educational service. And um, would phase out an, uh, an update the foundation budget formula. We'd love to see that happen, bringing more money to all five of our districts, uh, as there, in additional state aid and um, the legislature failed to pass any foundation budget legislation in the last session, leaving districts and educators and students without the necessary funds, um, supporting schools uh, our students deserve. So that's basically what we're asking it to say. So we agree, I, I don't think right. there's anybody on this committee that doesn't agree that those are all changes we'd like to see happen. Yeah. The problem is they've already had a bill based out of this kind of promise in the works. With that, we all agree with that. We agree that they're heading that direction. Yeah. So we, can we change the wording to reflect promise that? Is sure. That Student Opportunity Act. Student Opportunity Act. As long as that's the scope on my computer. One second. I have a real problem voting for this based on uh, item number four on the list because it does not phase in more money for all our schools. We have no way, no way of knowing that that's what it might do, and it sounds like it's not really going to do that. So that to vote for it seems, you know, the rest are just sort of. Change the word good to might. Yeah, but it's like, it's like, you know, Darius has said, uh, I think some of us have tried to look in to find out what we could to, about what this is, and it was clear to me that, um, you know, we're very likely at the end of this seven-year process going to end up with no better off than we are right now. Well, 
And so why should we be supporting? So, yeah, I mean, so let's just put this where it's at. It's symbolic in nature. And last year when this went around, I was probably my second or third as in terms superintendent. I probably wasn't even brought up. So I, I was not on the ball on this in the beginning. So um, so we kind of missed that, missed it out. If the committee doesn't want to add on to that list, I understand it's very different phase. We might be, I don't want to get into an argument about something. This is kind of a declaration that we're supporting public education and supporting a, a change in the way the state's looking at it. Um, however, we're now, it's now being linked to an exact bill that's in the, uh, the Senate right now that has a lot of controversy in it about where the money's going, the numbers that are coming out. The governor came out with different numbers that is causing it more of an upheaval because these numbers aren't agreeing with the Senate's numbers. Um, so, and when this thing gets done, it's probably gonna look nothing like it is now by the time it gets, you know, these get kind of chopped, they have to up. So this resolution is really about supporting our legislator to make change. And maybe we just, and, and get added to the list of everybody else is supporting the legislator to make change. Or we just stay quiet at this point. I think we're, so I kind of just want everybody to understand that's where we're at. We're not supporting that bill right. per se. We're, we're sort of, the work that's going behind the bill and the changes. And so I know it was late coming in. There was a lot of talk about it. Um, and as Jessica pointed out, hey, we're not even on the list of supporting this you know, venture going forward. We should be added there. So I wanted to bring it forward here. So. Do you, do, you know, do you know of any other schools in our district, in our area, that haven't voted for this or won't vote for it? What you could say? No. I think the idea is pretty you know, comprehensive, most of the schools. So, so I, I, when there, there's some, some of us that when, when, when the uh, joint when the joint education committee was doing their chapter 70 foundation committee roadshow this summer, there were some of us that went and, yes. and gave testimony to them when they showed up. And, uh, Northampton and then again in Pittsfield and then with um, And, and it, the, the thing, the, in the room, it was amazing. It, it, the Promise Act had like all the energy of everybody in the room. Yes. And, and a, a lot of, like, I, I actually believe, what we really wanted to do was to try to get them to explore changing the structure of the foundation budget and how they calculate it. And those are things that they actually could do relatively easy. Just change a number here or there and couldn't really get any momentum on that because all the option in the room was sucked up by the Promise Act. Um, and, and, and whenever one person would talk about something that would help us, somebody else would stand up and say, Promise Act, Promise Act, Promise Act. Uh, it is a good thing though, but I just wish it would come back in a different year and get the, the chance to do a foundation budget. Uh, chair of the House was not really lukewarm to a lot of that change, so it's kind of The most promising part of the Promise Act is the fact that they did pass that, well, what's still alive in the budget is putting a commission together yes. to look at the chapter funding, the chapter 70 formula yes. for equity, predictability, and accuracy. So it's in there. Does that mean a report that goes and sits on someone's desk, or is that going to really mean outcome? But that's, you know, we have to see if that's going to be important. It's part of it. It's, sarcastic thing, but, but it is at least there, and that's the most important, I think, to us as a district, we need that work there. If we, if we considered adding the word potentially bringing more money to all five of our districts? Since we already, since, since we've said it's kind of past and it couldn't look great right, right now, the ones that need help are going to get more help. So, yes, that's true. I don't disagree with what you said, Peter. Just I think it. I mean, I think it will. If you look at it, the Promise Act would phase in and update the foundation budget formula, bringing more money to all five of the districts. It will do that. It just won't do it at the amount we would like. But it will for other people who really, other schools who are really in tough shape and need it. So not that we don't. But we're better off than that. So we're going to vote on it. I think Bob has made a motion for Frontier. I do. Has anybody second for Frontier? Second. Any other questions from Frontier? All in favor? No? Staying? Always. That's why I was asking. Okay. We have a favor of yes on the. 
Staying? It's a fun exercise. Yes. Sorry, you got it this year? Okay. Oh, it's this year. Okay. 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 Quick while keeping things, can I need each chair to come forward to sign the uh, IA, IA um, contract? We've already signed, remember the settlement agreement, I have an official contract that needs to be signed. Um, additionally, remember how this works, we're at Frontiers meeting. The agendas are purposely light, meaning that there's just gonna be financial, uh, financials for the month and principal's reports. Uh, Deerfield has a little bit of stuff and and Sunderland has a little bit of discussion around the principal report. But um, outside of that, the next month, um, I'm speaking for Shelly at this point, is going to be a concentration of where we are financially. Right. Shelly is getting the dates, maybe we have those books, trying to get them in order so that we can have a more in-depth conversation of where we are at the closing of the books of each of the elementary schools at the, at the November meeting and then start doing the budget process for next year. So November is all about budget. Yeah. So, fun, fun. So, did I miss anything there? I just want to kind of say this, people go off. So we probably have about a 10 minute frontier meeting. The, sub, um, the elementary can go to their corners to conduct business. And like I said, they're, they're purposely light. It should be really anything controversial of any of those meetings. So do we need to wait for Shelly to come to us? There's no chance yeah, she she get to move on. I'm just going to pass out the warrants. I don't have anything to report other than I sent the expenditure reports around. So okay. if you have questions okay. and you want to wait, I'm happy to take questions. So you know what we'll do is we'll have Shelly go out and pass out the warrants and then come back and get the frontier. That we'll just skip good. around her at the frontier stuff. So okay. Can we go back here? Frontier. Oh, she's good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.